Hello and welcome to episode 22, Remastered. Continuing with this series on evolution, today I'm going to be going into detail on divergence and speciation. In the last episode, I discussed the mechanisms through which evolution affects populations of organisms. Specifically, I discussed how mutations create new alleles by introducing random changes to gene sequences, or to chromosome structure. I talked about how genetic drift pushes allele frequency up or down with random fluctuations between generations. I talked about how natural selection culls the unfit to sculpt a more adapted population, and how gene flow connects populations of a species through the wandering migrations of individuals who leave one herd or flock to go find and join another. Divergence and speciation occurs when gene flow between two populations comes to a halt. When genes flow between populations, uh, all of these populations will share a consistent genome. They're all genetically similar enough that they can all interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And in effect, they're all the same species. And this gene flow keeps them all connected. It maintains this homogeneity in the genes between the populations. It, it keeps them gathered together in this conglomeration called the species. So if we have this species that's a conglomeration of populations with gene flow keeping them all genetically connected, what happens when one of these populations becomes isolated? What happens when there's no more gene flow going to or from that population? Well, this population is no longer receiving genetic information from the other populations. They're effectively cut off. They're isolated in the wilderness. Individuals from other populations are no longer able or willing to come and mate with individuals in the isolated population. If mechanisms like natural selection, mutation, and genetic drift continue to influence the gene pool of this isolated population, but gene flow never reconnects that population to any of the other populations in the species, then the stage is set for divergence and speciation. Without the input of genes from other populations, the isolated population begins to go down its own evolutionary pathway, distinct from the populations that it used to interbreed with. In effect, the isolated population is diverging. This divergence takes place over literal evolutionary lengths of time. As the gene pool of the isolated population slowly reacts to its isolation, it will become increasingly different from the original gene pool, from the species gene pool, the one that was shared by all of the other populations in the original setting. The random fluctuations of genetic drift will inevitably push a few alleles to fixation or to complete deletion, while natural selection will further shape the population to their specific habitat. Mutations will generate genetic novelty in the background, slowly fueling this evolutionary fire. But because there's no gene flow, these new alleles that get generated by mutations and these adaptations that get developed by natural selection, they won't get shared with the other populations because uh, th this population in particular is genetically isolated. And so because of this, these alleles and these adaptations will accumulate in the isolated population. And this accumulation of these mutations and adaptations will make them increasingly distinct from their cousin populations, both genetically and morphologically. Occasionally, one or two individuals might be able to make it out of isolation to meet with another population and interbreed with them, although this rare case of gene flow in a diverging population will not really do anything except barely slow the process down. If the isolation continues for long enough, the divergence will continue to widen until the gene pool of the isolated population is very different from the gene pool of its cousin populations. Eventually, the gene pools will be so different that the populations can't interbreed anymore. At this point, they've successfully diverged into a new species. They've undergone speciation because they are now reproductively isolated. Crossbreeding between populations during the earliest stages of divergence, if possible, would most likely yield a hybrid that's rich in genetic diversity. Such hybrid individuals would enjoy the fitness benefits of their heterogeneous alleles through a phenomenon called hybrid vigor. Interbreeding during the later stages of divergence, however, is much less likely to yield a healthy offspring with hybrid vigor. 
Instead of healthy allele variety like you would get in two different but closely related populations, hybrids of far diverged populations are often unhealthy, with low fitness and many traits that offer clear disadvantages or disabilities. For example, mules are a hybrid between horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys are very closely related species, but they've been undergoing divergence such that they are, more or less, distinct species. And yet, they're still close enough, genetically speaking, to be able to interbreed and produce a live offspring. However, their hybrid mule offspring suffer from genetic complications that make them sterile. Because mules are sterile, they can't reproduce, and that means that there's no self-reproducing mule populations. If there were, if we did have these self-sufficient mule populations, then these mules would be able to interbreed with both donkeys and horses, and that would enable the existence of multiple populations of th this gradient of hybrids. You would span this genetic gradient between donkeys and horses, and eventually, this would cause this entire gene pool to coalesce, to re-emerge into a single species. But because the mules are sterile, this hypothetical hybrid population of mules can't exist. And so horses and donkeys are locked into this evolutionary divergence. They'll continue to diverge until they can't even produce mules anymore. So you might be thinking that this explanation makes the concept of species seem a little hazy. After all, what is a species? How do biologists define the term species? Well, think about it for a moment. How would you define a species? What criteria would you use to organize animals and plants and fungus and everything else into species? This has actually been a very surprising challenge for biologists, because when you really dive into it, you start to realize that there are a lot of ambiguities and gray areas that really complicate the search for a simple answer. There are multiple species concepts that biologists use to organize species, and the most obvious of them is the biological species concept. The biological species concept posits that a species can be defined by its reproductive isolation. Basically, if two species don't really ever attempt to breed in the wild, or if they do attempt to breed but they just produce non-viable, stillborn, or sterile offspring, then these species are reproductively isolated because they can't make hybrids with each other, and so they can be considered separate species. The biological species concept works on two groups of mechanisms. The first group of mechanisms are called prezygotic mechanisms, and these are impediments to mating, like geographic differences or incompatible mating behaviors. They're mechanisms that prevent species from meeting and trying to interbreed in the first place, or that prevent these species from producing a fertile zygote. <clears throat> For example, prezygotic isolation can also happen when species don't breed at the same time of year, or when they don't breed in the same habitats. It can happen when the egg and the sperm are too chemically different to successfully fertilize. Now the second group of mechanisms are post-zygotic mechanisms. These post-zygotic mechanisms are factors that prevent successful reproduction after the formation of the zygote, like developmental malformations in the zygote that end up producing a stillborn offspring, so the zygote just can never make it to, to birth. Or uh, another post-zygotic mechanism that's pretty common is sterility in the offspring that makes the offspring unable to reproduce. And like the horse, the donkey, and the mule, this means that you have two species that are close enough that they can produce a hybrid, but they're different enough that these hybrids have internal genetic problems that make them sterile. And so you, you never have this, this uh, reproductively fertile hybrid population bridge the genetic gap between the two parent species. Despite the seeming logical simplicity of the biological species concept, it's not actually perfectly useful in every circumstance. According to the biological species concept, different populations that can produce viable offspring would be considered the same species. So consider the case of lions and tigers. In the wild, their geographic ranges and their habitats virtually never overlap. Most of the time, when a lion meets a tiger, it's going to be in captivity, like in a zoo, or a university, or a palace somewhere. The tiger and the lion can breed to produce a fertile offspring called the liger. Even further, 
the ligers have been able to successfully breed with both lions and tigers. So what does this mean? It means that if we look at lions and tigers purely through the lens of the biological species concept, we would have to come to the conclusion that lions and tigers are the same species. Furthermore, the biological species concept can't be used to organize fossils, because fossilized species are typically extinct, and so they can't reproduce anymore, and their DNA has sufficiently degraded so that we can't really determine their genome either. The biological species concept also can't be used to organize asexual species, like bacteria, as these don't even bother with hybrids or sexual reproduction in the first place. So clearly, the biological species concept is powerful and it's useful for determining uh, how to organize and classify species, but it doesn't go far enough. There are still gaps that the biological species concept doesn't help us fill. The next major concept that biologists use is called the morphospecies concept, or the morphological concept. Basically, this means that animals and plants and fungus and everything else are organized into species groups based on their physical appearance, their phenotype, their morphology. The reasoning goes that as populations diverge and become unique species, they begin to possess distinct physical characteristics like size, color, shape, or something else that uniquely identifies them. Like the biological species concept, the morphological species concept has its strengths, but it also has its weaknesses. For example, the morphological species concept is remarkably useful for organizing extinct species through their fossils. Many dinosaur species are organized morphologically. There are several drawbacks to the morphological species concept that make it one of the less reliable methods for studying species. For example, if there's a species of animal that looks just like another species of animal, the morphological species concept will consider them to be the same species, even though they might have enough genetic, habitat, and behavioral differences to clearly demarcate them as a separate species. In circumstances like this, the species in question is called a cryptic species, because it's difficult to classify them based on their phenotype. Conversely, the morphological species concept will misidentify a polymorphic species as two or more different species. A polymorphic species is one that has a wide range of phenotypes. Individuals within this species population might look radically different from one another, so much so that they might get mistaken for entirely different species. This happens a lot with various birds, for example. On a genetic level, the polymorphic species is clearly a single species, but when they're viewed morphologically, they appear like a collective of similar but distinct species. Third, the morphological species concept runs into trouble because it's very subjective. One researcher may look at a few morphological differences and say that this is indicative of a different species, while another researcher, maybe another researcher in the exact same research team, might look at the same differences and be unconvinced. It's entirely possible that researchers might have different definitions, or a different understanding of the relatively subjective terminology that's used in the morphological concept, and all of this can make it difficult to communicate the data in an objective manner that would enable consistent, accurate categorization. The third major concept that biologists use to differentiate between species is called the phylogenetic species concept which blends the genetic relatedness seen with the biological species concept with the phenotypic similarities seen with the morphological species concept. Essentially, the phylogenetic species concept organizes species based on their evolutionary relationships with other species and other populations. To understand the phylogenetic concept, you have to understand something called a clade. A clade is a unit of organization, consisting of an ancestral species population and all of its descendant populations. Clades are identified based on common traits shared by most of the descendants of the ancestor populations. These common traits are called synapomorphies, and the differences in synapomorphies between populations is a strong indicator of halted gene flow and isolated reproduction, leading to divergence and speciation. For example, 
long trunk-like noses and long tusks are synapomorphy traits that connect elephants into a clade, just like how fur and lactation are traits that identify mammals as a clade. The phylogenetic concept will look at the genetic relatedness of a clade of animals sharing many of these synapomorphies, and it'll determine the number of species that are present based on the genetic variety. Consider elephants. There are Asian elephants and two kinds of African elephants, those that live in the forest and those that graze along the more open savanna. Each of these represent the smallest clades, or the distinct species of elephants. Within each clade, there are smaller population groups, like how within the species of African forest elephants, there are populations living in Cameroon and populations living in the Congo, or how there are populations within the species of African savanna elephant that live in the Congo savanna and those that live across the eastern and southern plains of Africa. All of these groups of populations within a particular species all share the same set of synapomorphies. They're all close enough genetically that they can interbreed, and they all share the same genes coding for the same set of synapomorphic traits. According to the phylogenetic species concept, these populations are not separate species. But the genetic and morphological differences between African forest and African savanna elephants are large enough that biologists choose to label each group of populations as distinct species. The phylogenetic species concept is very detailed, but that's what makes it so useful. It incorporates aspects of both the biological species concept and the morphological species concept. For that matter, the phylogenetic species concept can also be used to organize fossils and asexual species, which the biological concept can't. And the phylogenetic concept can also be used to identify cryptic species and polymorphic species, which the morphological concept can't. The one downside to the phylogenetic species concept is that, because it's so detailed, it requires a tremendous amount of data. Researchers must have sequenced and cataloged the full genome of every population in question before they can really start making accurate conclusions. And as a result, the phylogenetic species concept can only be reliably applied to organisms that are under intensive study. Biologists try to use all of these species concepts where they're most applicable in order to get the clearest picture of what constitutes a distinct species. Taxonomy remains a stubbornly complex field, simply because of the ambiguity and inherent subjectivity involved in defining a species. All right, I feel like I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself. I've discussed how biologists determine and study species, and I've mentioned how a lack of gene flow can lead to reproductive isolation and then divergence and speciation, but this isn't the whole picture. When I say that gene flow is halted, what exactly does this mean? If gene flow is just individuals moving and breeding between separate populations, then how could that ever be halted? What are the mechanisms through which gene flow can get shut down in the first place? These are all very important questions because the answers help us understand how species begin diverging and speciating in the first place. There's two conditions under which divergence and speciation can occur, and these conditions are called allopatry and sympatry. To keep it brief, allopatry occurs when a population experiences geographic isolation. A mountain range, a river, a ravine, or a canyon, or even just sheer distance. All of these things can act as a physical impediment to gene flow. They are obstructions that prevent individuals from migrating between populations. Now, sympatry occurs when divergence and speciation takes place in populations who share the same geographic habitat, but are isolated in some other capacity. It could be that sympatric isolation occurs because the populations mate at different times of the year, or different times of day or they prefer different mating calls and they fail to attract mates from the opposite population, or perhaps they dwell in different parts of the same habitat, like lizards that live in the tree canopies versus lizards who dwell on the ground. Now that I've briefly summarized uh, allopatry and sympatry, I want to dig into them in a little more detail. Okay, let's begin with allopatric isolation, 
Allopatric isolation occurs when population groups evolve separately after having been separated by geography. This happens most often through basic dispersal. A few individuals will wander away from the herd, away from the main population group, and they will end up colonizing some other suitable habitat some distance away. If this migrating population manages to settle somewhere that's a huge distance away from any other population, then it'll be isolated by sheer distance. Because it's highly unlikely that some wandering, meandering individual would just randomly stumble upon them and then interbreed with them, gene flow is minimal, if not non-existent. This is the case for the finches in the Galapagos Islands. Occasionally, a few birds from one island will colonize another island, founding a new population group that, through genetic drift and natural selection, will slowly diverge from its ancestral finch population. Given enough time, the birds on separate islands will become their own species, even with the small amount of gene flow that still occurs. Alternatively, allopatric isolation can occur when a habitat is physically split in two by some kind of event. This is called vicariance. It's a pretty simple concept, but it has really big ramifications. Imagine a great forest inhabited by a population of brown bears. One day, the banks of a nearby river erode, and the flow of water breaks out of the riverbed and finds a new course downhill. This redirected torrent of water cuts through the forest, ripping up trees and breaking apart the moist ground. When the theoretical dust has settled in the forest, the river has carved itself a new riverbed, directly through the middle of this forest. Unfortunately for the bears, this has split their population in two. When the river came through and split the forest, some of these bear individuals were on one side of the forest, and other individuals were on the other side. And because the river is too fast-moving and too deep and too wide to cross, the river has split the habitat and thus geographically isolated the population groups. The stage is now set for allopatric divergence and speciation. So now let's get to sympatry. I feel like allopatry is a, is a pretty simple concept to understand. I mean, you just got geographic obstacles, like mountains or rivers or canyons, or just really big distances, and these are all barriers to gene flow. They isolate populations, and they promote divergence. It's pretty straightforward. But sympatry is a little more complicated, because in sympatry, the divergent populations still share the same habitat. They just interact with each other and their habitat in different ways. There's behavioral differences that cause the population groups to diverge. So much like how allopatry works through dispersal and vicariance, sympatry works through external and internal events that modulate the behavior of individuals within one of these population groups. So external events happen outside of the organism's body, and they promote divergence. When populations adapt to fit their habitat, they evolve to fill what biologists call a niche. A niche is the place the animal takes within an ecosystem, taking into consideration the resources that it uses and the environmental conditions that it can handle. For example, a bug that eats the leaves of a particular plant has a niche as an herbivorous predator for that plant. This implies a competitive economic relationship with the other organisms in the habitat who might eat that plant for food, or who might use that plant for shelter, or who use that plant as a host for their larva, or for organisms like fungus who might have a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship with the plant. So if the population of predator bugs eats the leaves of this plant and they, they kill the plant in large numbers, the collective effect of their consumption will deny that plant resource to these other populations who use them for shelter, or for food of their own, or for hosts for their larvae, or whatever. As a result, the actions of one population will force responses in the other populations of other species. As all of the animals and all of the plants share resources and interact with one another regularly in this ecological food web, the pressures of natural selection are at work in every relationship. It's very ecological, because everything is related and interconnected. Everything tugs and pushes on everything else. You literally can't even eat the leaves off a plant without it having downstream consequences for other organisms. So with that being said, sympatric isolation can occur when these selection pressures 
drive population groups into distinct niches, which would discourage physical interaction and reproduction with other population groups who happen to be adapting to another distinct niche. By being pushed into different niches, population groups within the same species can become behaviorally isolated from one another, even though they live next door, so to speak. For example, say that there's a population of lizards that lives all over a particular type of tree. They live on the roots, on the ground, on the trunk, and in the canopy. Of this lizard population, just by happenstance, some individuals might generally prefer to hang out in the tree canopy, high up in the leaves, while others might prefer to hang out on the ground, by the roots and the dirt and the soil. This variation in behavior among the lizard population is an example of the individual variation that natural selection works with. So assume that the lizards are a popular food source for local animals. So these lizards experience a very strong selection pressure to avoid predation. Those lizards who can hide the best are the most likely to survive and reproduce. But in that regard, the lizard population is experiencing two different selection pressures. The lizards who are a little more green are better able to blend into the leaves of the tree canopies while they stand out on the ground and they're easier to see when they're surrounded by dirt and dark roots and stuff like that. But then you also have lizards who live on the ground who are better able to hide if they have a darker color, like a brown or a dark green or a black or a gray. But this dark coloration makes them stand out in the leaves of the trees. The lizard population will experience a disruptive selection as the ground-dwelling lizards and the tree-canopy-dwelling lizards will diverge into their own populations. If this sympatric isolation continues to full speciation, it could be that the tree-dwelling lizards become nimble, bright green reptiles adapted to hide in the leaves and flitter along the treetops, while the ground-dwelling lizards could become heavier, sturdier, dirt-colored creatures capable of burrowing into the soil to hide. Other examples of sympatric isolation working on an external variable include fruit flies like the hawthorn fly and the apple fly, which have diverged after disruptive selection emphasized a preference for the scent of apples in a subgroup of hawthorn flies. This subgroup began using the apples as places to lay their eggs instead of hawthorn fruit, which began a process of divergence that continues to this day. You have these the hawthorn flies that lay their eggs in hawthorn fruit, and then you have this subgroup of these apple flies that have this uh, attraction to these apples, and so they choose to lay their eggs there. And this behavioral difference is causing the species to diverge. Another example includes songbirds, who are attracted to mates depending on the kind and the quality of the song that they sing. Populations of these songbirds can undergo sympatric isolation when subgroups begin exhibiting preferences for specific notes or songs, and they selectively breed with the individuals who prefer to make those specific notes or songs. These are all external mechanisms of sympatric isolation, but you should remember that I also mentioned internal mechanisms. Internal mechanisms of sympatric isolation are basically mutations that alter genes or duplicate chromosomes. In animals, these mutations are almost always fatal, but in plants, these mutations can lead to the rapid development of new species. A mutation during meiosis can end up producing double the normal number of chromosomes. These individual plants who possess double the normal number of chromosomes are called polyploids, referencing the abnormal number of chromosomes that they possess in their cells. In a circumstance called autopolyploidy, a mutation in meiosis will cause a plant to produce diploid gametes instead of haploid gametes, and the resulting offspring will end up having four copies of their chromosomes, which makes them tetraploids. Tetraploids have four copies of their chromosomes, and they naturally produce diploid gametes, which can't fertilize normal haploid gametes. The biochemistry of the diploid and the haploid gametes just doesn't lend itself to proper fertilization, and so tetraploid and diploid plants of the same species can't reproduce. This means that, according to the biological species concept, these tetraploid plants aren't really even the same species as their parents at all. There are new species of reproductively isolated plants that happen to emerge in a single generation. 
This is also weird because the parent plant, uh, because they had this mutation to their gametes that gave rise to this tetraploid offspring, the parents gave birth to a different species. That's really weird, but that's just how it works with plants. There's another weird form of this that's called allopolyploidy, wherein a diploid and a haploid gamete are able to fuse together uh, against the odds to produce a triploid offspring. Now this process to produce a triploid offspring is really complicated, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically, these triploid plants can produce both haploid and diploid gametes, and this makes them a, a, a strange trans species plant. It's very complicated. Okay, so now I've established what species are. I've established how they become isolated and how they diverge into new species. But there's still something left to ask. What happens if two populations that have been diverging for a long time are suddenly able to interbreed again? This happens a lot in nature, and there are several possible outcomes depending on the extent of the divergence and the nature or the frequency of their interbreeding. In most cases, if you have two diverging populations and they are no longer isolated, they'll just start interbreeding again, and gene flow will slowly reduce the genetic differences between them by making them more genetically homogenous. They're sharing all of their alleles into one larger gene pool. After all, if some alleles unique to one population are introduced into another through gene flow, then those alleles are now shared between the populations, and that makes them that much more genetically similar. But this clean reuniting of the populations doesn't always happen. There are other possible outcomes that can happen from this return to interbreeding. If two populations have diverged for a very long time, they might be very, very genetically different from one another. They'll have adapted pretty well to their own habitats. If individuals from each of these different populations can somehow interbreed, they'll produce a hybrid who will share traits from both parents. But instead of giving the offspring a high fitness for both environments, the hybrids will end up being poorly adapted to both environments. As a result, there's a selection pressure against interbreeding, as gestating, giving birth to, and then raising the low fitness hybrids would generally be a waste of energy and resources. This process is called reinforcement, because the low fitness of the hybrids makes natural selection reinforce the mating preferences for breeding that were the norm before each population was isolated. So in a nutshell, if you have a population that's been diverging long enough that they can still interbreed to produce hybrids, but the hybrids are kind of sickly and they have this weird mishmash of traits and adaptations that make them not very good at adapting to either habitat that their parents belong to, then they're just a low-fitness hybrid, and it's very unlikely that these are going to persist and produce their own hybrid population of their own. They're just probably going to die out. Natural selection is going to apply a very strong pressure against these hybrids, and so it's quite likely that the divergence that was already going on for a long time is just going to continue. In cases where these hybrids don't suffer from low fitness, gene flow can end up creating so-called hybrid zones, or large regions where the habitats of each parent population overlap. In these overlapping regions, in these overlapping hybrid zone habitats, the populations can interbreed and give birth to hybrids. And if the hybrids are fertile and enjoy a competitive fitness, then they can establish their own populations and create the hybrid zone. These hybrid zones occur all over the world with all sorts of different species. For example, this has occurred on the northwest Pacific coast of the U.S. and Canada with various species of warblers. The Townsend warbler has its habitat in southeast Alaska and western Canada, extending down into Washington State, Idaho, and Oregon. And then you have the hermit warbler that lives along the northern California coastline and valleys and the coasts of Oregon and Washington. Now, both territories, from the, the Hermit Warbler and the Townsend Warbler, they overlap in western Washington. And this area of overlap is a hybrid zone for the Townsend's hybrid warbler. In this way, you can see that species aren't really, like, clearly defined groups. They're more like a living gradient of life spread across an expanse of geographic space. From these hybrid zones and genetic gradients, 
can emerge entirely new species. These new hybrids share a unique combination of alleles from both their parent species, or both their parent populations, and thus they have a unique combination of traits with which to interact with their environment. These unique combinations of traits allow the hybrids to interact with the environment in unique ways, which enables them to successfully diverge into a specific niche and establish themselves as an entirely new species. When divergence is interrupted and two distinct population groups begin interbreeding again, they can merge back together into a single species, or they can experience reinforcement as natural selection pushes them into two different niches. The populations can create hybrids, which thrive in hybrid zones, able to go on and become their own hybrid populations that can diverge into their own distinct species. Sometimes, the hybrids can outcompete one or both parent populations, driving them to extinction or pushing them out into new territories. This reproductive isolation, this great reduction in gene flow between populations, is required in order for a population to diverge into a new species. When there's a healthy amount of gene flow, populations will be continually sharing their alleles, and as such, they'll never diverge. They'll remain in this conglomeration called a species. When a river disrupts a population through allopatric isolation, or when a behavioral change or a selection pressure disrupts a population through sympatric isolation, the result is the same. The reproductive isolation seals off the gene pool in its own little microcosm, where genetic drift, mutation, and natural selection will swirl and stir and mix the gene pool. In time, the isolated populations will grow apart, eventually becoming entirely distinct species, reproductively, morphologically, and phylogenetically. All right, this episode was a doozy. I had a blast doing the research for this, and I hope you were able to enjoy it just as much. I hope you learned something that you thought was cool, and that you're now at least a little bit more interested in evolutionary biology and the mechanisms of divergence and speciation. If you aren't subscribed to the podcast, then hit the subscribe button. And if you like this episode, then go ahead and give me a like. I always appreciate it. And as always, thanks for listening.